This Zoom replay video was originally streamed summer 2020 and is a part of the Tibet House U.S. Menla online offerings. To learn more about upcoming retreats in person and online, please visit our website at menla.org. So this talk uh, is psychedelic assisted therapy in contemplative practice for healing. As I said, this could go in a lot of different directions. So I have notes to try to keep me on track. Those of you who see me know that I can get a little off track, right? <laughs> so I have slides for guidance. Um, I am Elizabeth Nielsen. I am a, uh, have a doctoral degree in clinical psychology. Um, I am the co-founder of a organization called Fluence, which is a psychedelic education program. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, by way of background, um, after completing my doctoral degree, I did an NIH-funded postdoctoral fellowship in um, specifically in drug use research um, and completed that a couple of years ago. Um, I've also had roles uh, in directing education and training programs, specifically with the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program in New York, which is part of the Center for Optimal Living. Um, I have been a clinical research therapist and part of the clinical uh, research teams at NYU, uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is also New York City, as well as part of the MAPS uh, research team in New York. Um, that's the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, so I've been involved in a whole broad range of, of projects in this uh, field of psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, I One of the roles that I have in the world of clinical psychedelic research is um, providing training for therapists who are going to be doing that work in the research setting. Um, Mostly we're working with treatments that aren't available outside of the research setting, um, but I'm one of the people that provides training and mentoring for therapists that are working in those, um, on those projects. Um, I'm also uh, doing a study at NYU which involves interviewing people who have come through psychedelic assisted therapy uh, protocol and um, learning from them about their experience and what their uh, subjective firsthand accounts of their experience is. So um, I am really full-time in this uh, world in a lot of different places. Um, and I, I know that there may be uh, some of you here who are involved in, in certain ways in this field, maybe in some aspects of certain of different projects. Um, and it can be, this can look like quite a lot to build, but um, this is, you know, this is building for, for several years now. So um, it started small. <laughs> It didn't say that way. Um, so I recently also, in addition to these things, um, founded a, an education program with my business partner, Ingmar Gorman, who is another psychologist in New York. And this is a photo of us last year in uh, Montreal when we were allowed to travel. Um, we were at a, um, this was actually at an open uh, public evening on the campus of McGill. Um, <clears throat> and the fellow introducing us in the in the jacket and the jeans is Joe Flanders. He's the director of Mindspace Wellbeing. Uh, Mindspace is a psychotherapy clinic that had brought us there. Um, they focus on mindfulness-based um, practices, and they had brought us up there to teach a weekend training workshop. And um, I wanted to post this because our, our work with Joe and with Mindspace um, really uh, – for me began to help solidify my discussion of the role of contemplative practices and meditation in psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, this was for me a bit of a turning point where I had, you know, thought a lot about it and trained a lot in psychedelic um, assisted therapy, as well as in mindfulness practices and contemplative practices, um, but hadn't really begun to articulate how I'd want to, how I would see the, the bridge between those things. Um, so this has some this has some significance as well as just being um, kind of a nice uh, kind of a nice shot to to introduce us by. Anyway, that's me. That's my business partner, and that's Joe from Mindspace. Um, so the reason we started an education program in psychedelic assisted therapy, and well, we don't teach psychedelic assisted therapy at the moment. We're gearing up to, but we're teaching um, a lot about the psychedelic assisted therapy models and world and 
background and research that's going on. We don't actually teach the technique yet because it's, again, not available to do outside of research studies at this time with MDMA and psilocybin. Um, the reason that we started uh, working with this uh, in this paradigm was because we really wanted to address the need for training in this area. Uh, a lot of professionals are interested, a lot of people are interested, uh, but there weren't really a lot of opportunities for people to get professional education in this field. Uh, and those opportunities that there were available were really limited to people who were already in positions of power and, uh, and uh, authority um, and in the existing um, in the existing institutions and in the existing um, field. So we really wanted to open things up. Um, we wanted to create an enhanced diversity in the field um, and in doing so create programs that would be more accessible, um, more you know, available to people uh, without necessarily having an affiliation with a research site or an institution uh, to be able to, to get in and, and get some, at least just some basic orientation to the field. Um, we know that uh, you know we're. We know that there are uh, huge disparities in the um, available healthcare and quality of healthcare, um, with disproportionate uh, care being available to people representing marginalized groups. And so, um, part of our effort to um, create training programs that are more open and accessible to people um, is a way of bringing more opportunities in so that there can be more diverse representation among various uh, at various levels of um, work within the psychedelic assisted therapy um, field and also within you know psychedelic healthcare in a broader uh, in a broader way so um, we just started <laughs> this work a couple of months ago, really. Um, we're, doing, uh, we're doing the most that we can. We've been working a lot on credentialing and establishing a diversity fund and things like that. You can find out more about us uh, at our website. The link is at the end of this presentation. Um, so one of the things that we do in our trainings always has been to incorporate, incorporate um, meditation and other contemplative practices into our trainings and retreats. So tonight I'm going to give a little bit of background about the relationship between uh, psychedelic therapy and contemplative practices and why we include those in um, our, why we include those in our trainings about psychedelic assisted therapy, right? And um, why we talk about them in our work and how we talk about them in our work. Um, so for that motive, I'll tell you that um, in addition to my background in psychology and clinical research, I also have a background in meditation and, and some other contemplative practices. Um, I spent a lot of time in school for psychology. And the whole time, uh, I was really curious about how I could learn from and explore my internal uh, subjective experience. But there was hardly any mention of this in psychology school. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was like theory and ethics and history and diagnostics and statistics and social psychology and practice issues and more statistics. Um, and there, it all seemed a little bit on the concrete side to me and maybe even a little bit superficial, some of it. Um, it didn't really, it wasn't really touching on what I was looking for personally. Um, and I didn't find what I was really interested in until I wandered away from my, uh, my training uh, site in New York City down the street to New York Insight uh, Meditation Center, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, and signed myself up for a weekend non-residential retreat. I had no idea what I was getting into. But I knew that I was headed in the right direction. Um, and from there, uh, I began to study more and more uh, meditation and get instruction um, and develop a practice. And um, over the years, because I was already so far along in the psychology world, it didn't make sense to drop out of school and you know meditate full time. But I was able to start bringing a lot of meditative practice and meditation informed therapies into my practice of psychology. Um, so I got trained in mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, a lot of things you've probably heard of, um, and really started focusing on the ways that my meditation practice and the um, teachings of that could inform what I was doing as a psychologist, as a therapist. So um, 
I, this, is, this became part of the story of getting involved with psychedelics. I wasn't actually looking to get involved with psychedelics, but several years later, um, I had the opportunity to get involved with a clinical trial of psilocybin. Um, and I you know, joined a training team and thinking, okay, this will be a really interesting project. I understand this. I'm very interested in you know, helping to find better and more um, better empirically supported treatments for, uh, for this cause specifically, uh, for this diagnostic category, and very interested in the whole idea of working with psilocybin and kind of turning the uh, you know, paradigm of a, uh, a drug uh, that's been thought of as a drug of abuse back in, you know, into uh, and using it in a way that's therapeutic. Very interested in all that. And after several years of working in this, um, I began to notice that the actual uh, practice, the actual meditation practice and the frameworks that I had learned about that practice and those experiences were really of immense benefit in uh, seeing my patients through their experiences of psychedelic assisted therapy. And this held true over the course of several different types of experiences and trials. It wasn't just like one thing, but um, I really started to find this incredibly valuable and in ways that I, I never, I hadn't really imagined that I would. So I'm going to backtrack a minute because I could go along pretty far out along that limb. Um, but let's backtrack a minute and start and talk a little bit about what are psychedelics? Um, what do I mean by this? Because it, it can mean different things to different people. So it's good to clarify this. Psychedelics uh, is a word that means mind manifesting. It's usually used to describe uh, serotonergic hallucinogens, things like LSD, DMT, psilocybin. These are all a sort of family of drugs that have similar uh, pharmacological properties and subjective um, experiences. They vary greatly in intensity and duration, but they've, they've got some similarities. Um, the word is also used to describe things like mescaline and ibogaine and 2CB and ketamine and MDMA um, that have different pharmacological properties and different mechanisms of action and different subjective effects. But it's, it's an umbrella term for... Um, compounds that alter our sense of perception, our sense of who we are, our sense of time, our sense of our self in relation to the world, um, and are m many of which are or can be used in a psychedelic assisted therapy paradigm, right? Where you're using that experience as part of psychotherapy to help work with some kind of psychological difficulty or diagnosis. So we're gonna move on to that in just a moment, but, um, there are a lot of words to describe uh, subsets of the psychedelics category. Um, and you may have heard some of these like psychotomimetics, which references their uh, purported ability to, um, to, uh, in, to, to bring about a psychotic or a psychosis like experience. Um, this was an old model that um, people used to use uh, psychedelics to try to study what that experience might be like or to try to experience something similar to it. Um, hallucinogens is the word used in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I think it's a bit of a misnomer because most of these things don't really create hallucinations. Um, they create more like perceptual uh, alterations, illusions, and things like that. But that's the term that's, that's associated uh, with the more medical end of this uh, spectrum. Um, but what these have in common is that many are, uh, another thing they have in common is many of these are naturally occurring compounds or based in naturally occurring compounds. And many of these are derived from plants that have associations with indigenous use, with shamanic use, with uh, ritual or religious use. Um, and in some cases, important to mention, in some cases, the prohibition of these uh, substances is at least partly related to the oppression of indigenous communities. Um, it's not, our, our system is not separate from that, right? The, the scheduling and prohibition of these drugs is not based in necessarily in scientific research about their actual dangers, but it has, it's based in social and political context. Um, which includes uh, efforts in that direction. Um, and we also have associ additional associations uh, fueling their prohibition or their restriction. Um, for instance, association with counterculture and anti-war movements of the 1960s. Um, so there's, there's a lot of 
social and uh, political associations that people make with these with these compounds, and then in that uh, in the trajectory of that. Um, has come and came for a long time, a lot of stigma about these drugs, which really kept us from having an open dialogue about their potential benefits, their actual risks, um, and how they might be used in a therapeutic paradigm. So that's all kind of background stuff. I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to dive too far into that history, but um, just know that this, these are, these can be tricky topics and they can really bring up a lot of associations for folks. And, and we're not working in a world that's, that's free of any of that, right? Um, in fact, we're working very much in that context. Um, we all have some knowledge of these drugs. Like we've all heard of them. We all have some association, even if we know them only as illegal drugs. Um, that and that is rooted in our in our cultural context. Okay. Um, but what do we know else about how we define them? That's not the only. That's not the only thing, right? One way that we could talk about psychedelics is to talk about them as compounds that can facilitate the process of examining one's inner life. They can make the experience of one's inner life more accessible. They can inspire fascination with the nature of the mind, with the limits of perception, with the very experience of the self as a fixed, stable thing, right? Um, they, uh, they can cause a questioning of beliefs or of just assumptions about the nature of reality uh, and about constructs that are often taken for granted. And just by having people experience things differently, right? They don't, it's not necessarily um, an idea that has to be planted, but just people experiencing things differently can cause some questioning of, you know, by extension of that. Um, for instance, the construct of time is often experienced differently while people are under the influence of a psychedelic, especially the classic psychedelics or serotonergic hallucinogens, but many others will do that as well. Um, and while many of us have, an, for instance, an intellectual knowledge that the idea of time is an illusion, uh, the physicists tell us so, we just know that because the physicists tell us so, right? Um, we might even think it's kind of funny because we're always trying to get somewhere on time. Um, but experiencing it as such is really not so readily accessible for the untrained mind or the, you know, not, <laughs> not advanced physicist thinking mind, right? Um, so just having that experiential knowledge of something uh, gives people a basis for sometimes extending that questioning and extending that, um, that ability to think in new ways about things, right? See themselves differently in relation to things. So you're probably hearing a lot of things that sound like they might be of interest from the perspective of a meditator. We saw a couple people here who said they heard about this through Menla. I'm going to presume that some of you here have a meditation practice of some kind. Um, any kind is any kind is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, uh, not, I'm not uh, you know, partial to any particular type, but if you have some meditation experience or you're interested in having some meditation experience, you might be hearing some things that sound a little bit uh, like they could be of interest, right? Like, isn't that what meditation is about? That getting beyond the limits of perception and digging a little deeper into the experience of the self. And wait a minute, could psychedelics help with meditation? Well, maybe, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> there is, however, a really interesting body of research that I encourage you to check out about overlapping uh, experiences, psychedelic studies that have been done with experienced meditators, um, with meditators who are actually on retreat, um, and looking at some of the uh, some of the overlap and um, not just experiential overlap, but actual uh, with uh, neurological measures and brain imaging studies. There's some really interesting stuff in that in that direction, but it's not quite where I'm going to go. I want to tell you about psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, so psychedelic assisted therapy is a model of using one to a full, a few, sometimes, you know, two to three, uh, full dose psychedelic sessions embedded in a variety of models of, of therapeutic support with the goal of treating a specific profile of symptoms, a specific syndrome related to a mental health, uh, diagnosis or problem. Okay, so for instance, psilocybin assisted therapy for alcohol use disorder or alcohol use problems um, is being researched. And this involves 12 weeks of uh, psychotherapy focused on alcohol use and problems 
uh, for, and, and preparing for the uh, psychedelic sessions and then supporting people through those sessions uh, and continuing with psychotherapy with another set of sessions um, embedded therein. Uh, the graphic here comes from a paper on which um, Alicia Danforth, a researcher at UCLA, was a lead author, um, but I've chosen it simply because it's a beautiful little illustration of the Pro, the progress of therapy and the the sort of timing and spacing of sessions and you could think of it as being like each of these bars being approximately a week apart so you may have several weekly preparation sessions a psychedelic session several more weeks of um sessions to integrate and work with that experience and then another psychedelic session so we're not talking about daily dosing schemes we're not talking about ongoing use of the medication we're talking about a few acute intense experiences embedded within a larger a longer uh, framework of what's really a brief psychotherapy intervention right and these models vary widely between different um different uh protocols and it's all you know mostly research stage stuff right now but this is like a Pretty typical one. <laughs> so, um, so psychedelics can be used in lots of other ways, in lots of other settings, and for lots of other purposes. Uh, they can be used in ceremonies. They can be used in festivals. They can be used sometimes uh, with peer groups or on one's own. Whole variety of uh, motives, reasons, um, intentions, and things. But um, when I talk about psychedelic assisted therapy, this is what I'm talking about a clinical care model. There's a diagnosis, there's a therapist, there's a patient, just like regular psychotherapy. You've got that container, you've got that clinical, um, that clinical outcome that you're looking for, right? Um, so, why am I talking about this? Do psychedelics. Uh, does psychedelic assisted therapy involve meditation? Well, that kind of depends on who you ask. Because from a meditator's perspective, I hear a lot of things that sound pretty familiar. Um, it depends on what model is being practiced, and it depends on what the focus of treatment is. But most modern protocols that I'm familiar with um, involve a few sessions of preparation where people are actually asked to practice or plan to practice or plan to engage in uh, introspection during their um, psychedelic session experience, right? And by this, I mean they're asked to focus on their internal experience, at least to the extent they're able to during the session. They're provided with an environment that's conducive to this. Uh, it usually includes a comfortable place with eye shades and headphones and the presence of their therapists to um, kind of keep uh, keep them safe and attend to their needs for the day so they don't have, you know, to worry about the outside world. Um, and it really limits, you know, interference or the need to engage with, with others outside of the session. Um, and when I first heard the instructions that were being given, and we began to hear the instructions that were being given at the beginning of and leading up to uh, psychedelic sessions in psychedelic assisted therapy, I was thinking, wow this is really similar to the instructions that we'd give somebody for a meditation retreat, right? Turn off your cell phone. Don't need to, you know, call the outside world. Notice what that's like. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, close your eyes or maybe soften your gaze so you're not uh, taking in so much visual information. You're not engaged in talking with others, which means you're not um, engaged with, uh, you know, conjuring up a sense of who I am in relation to you and navigating all the stuff that goes with that, uh, you're, you're really asked to tune into what's going on in an internal way. Um, and I, so I saw a lot of similarities, a lot of, a lot of overlap. There's a safe container uh, and there's this encouragement and support uh, and on a meditation retreat, it's from the teachers and the, the sangha. And in a, a psychedelic session, it's from the therapists as well as the study team that's kind of there in the background, but not necessarily in the room. Um, there's this, this environment of social support and dedication to this process, right? Everybody's valuing this process and the person is uh, asked to engage in. Um, so clearly in my mind, there's some overlap here in the direction and perhaps uh, similar value found, you know, across um, 
across some of these practices that that there's some shared uh, there's some shared instruction and there's some shared value. Um, but I don't want to you know suggest that the subjective experiences are the same or that one is interchangeable with the other. Uh, that's that's not where I'm going at all. I want to make that very clear. Um, the subjective aspects and the experience of both meditation and psychedelic therapy have incredible variation within groups um and you know there is not just one meditation practice or just one type of psychedelic session um but you know we we do see some uh potential for conversation um we are talking about two very different uh and not interchangeable um practices so making that really clear now, uh, but this experience has led me to believe that contemplative practices such as meditation can be of interest in the preparation for and support for integrating psychedelic sessions and for working with that material. Um, now, again, there's a variety of ways I could go with this, but I'm just going to pick one. Uh, the thing that I really want to talk about tonight, and, and this is kind of the, this is kind of the key, getting down to the key point here, um, is that, um, the value for psychedelic therapists in having a contemplative practice and having experience with a contemplative practice. Now, there are a lot of people who, uh, in the field who talk a lot about uh, the value of psychedelic therapists having their own experience of psychedelics. And that is a completely different subject than what I'm, than what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not going to go into that subject right now. I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not going to justify it or defend it or explain it or dispute it at all. Um, that aside, I want to suggest that there's a different set of uh, skills that also have value that may be um, very important uh, for psychedelic therapists that could be um, that could be acquired or developed through contemplative practice. Uh, and the contemplative practice offers not just uh, not a, an alternative to having uh, a psychedelic experience um, as a, you know, a different way of having a non-ordinary state of consciousness experience, although it, it does and it can be that, but that it also offers some skill development um, that, I, that I think can be very important and relevant for psychedelic therapists. So a couple things it might help with are developing the capacity to maintain attention and awareness during eight-hour sessions. Most therapists are pretty well practiced at developing attention and sustaining their uh, presence with someone for 50 minutes, maybe 45, um, occasionally 60, eight hours is a whole different thing. So uh, this is something that I think um, meditation practice, especially retreat practice, can really come in handy for. Um, developing attitudes of openness and curiosity towards one's internal experience so that these can be embodied and modeled, not just taught as concepts. Um, you know, these are all really based in my, uh, my experience and theoretical development of this idea, but it's really different to explain something to someone like the concept of being open and curious towards their experience uh, versus to practice it oneself towards one own, one's own experience right there in the room. Um, and meditation experience can teach us just how much we are heckling ourselves right? Anybody ever gone on retreat and just sat there and heckled themselves all day or, uh, you know, given themselves a hard time about something all day? Uh, it can really, really illuminate that process. So when we have that experience, we may better be able to um, just better be able to, to keep those attitudes towards ourself, ourselves, which can make them easier for uh, others to uh, practice right along with us. Um, and I think it can also help us to develop a capacity to hold a steadiness of awareness through a really wide variety of internal experiences. Again, lots of psychotherapists get therapy, but that doesn't necessarily um, give them practice in maintaining uh, a sense of um, a sense of being aware of what's going on in their in their internal process and not being completely you know thrown off course by it right in the moment okay so it gives us a sense of my what might what might we find in there what might we um expect and and how to stay stable through and weather some of those storms right um but these are some of the basics it's not quite what i wanted to to, to get to the thing that i really want to suggest is that meditation practice 
uh, contemplative practice and the Buddhist psychological framework in which it's understood offers a framework for understanding the nature of self that kind of goes beyond what most, most of what is taught and understood in traditional psychology and psychotherapy training programs. You remember me talking earlier about my experience in uh, psychology school, right? And not finding what I really wanted, which was uh, some, uh, some education about the nature of my internal experience. Um, and so I think that, that the, these practices in this, and the contemplative practice framework, the psychology in, in which they're explained, uh, really do offer something that's, that's of value there. Um, these psychology programs and psychotherapy programs, mental health training programs in general, they really, many of them are wonderful and they're, um, they can provide an amazing education. Um, they do tend to focus on a conceptualization of mental health that conceptualizes um, mental health as a healthy ego development and functioning. And what I mean by that is that pathology or problems are largely seen as a breakdown in the process of development somewhere along the way, something didn't go quite right. Um, and that uh, or an inability, a lack of enough strength of that ego to function and meet the demands of the daily stressors of life or the uh, extremely exacerbated stressors of life in instances such as trauma and um, more extreme situations, right? Um, and healing is seen as the restoration of the healthy self or the healthy functioning ego that's able to um, become stable and adequately in you know, adequately integrated and uh, cope with the realities of the world that we live in. So that's, that's where, you know, that's kind of the prevailing idea. Um, there isn't really, except for, save so, some certain uh, very specific schools, a whole lot of framework for understanding and working with uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness experiences, such as those experienced during meditation and psychedelic experiences. Um, Buddhist psychology, with meditation being the experience and practice of its principles, offers a principle that a fixed, stable sense of self is in itself a problem um, and, and or leading to problems or creating problems uh, or inherently will at some point if it's held too tightly um, and is something to be moved beyond. And so it generally presumes a relatively healthy level of development if people are beginning meditation practice. Um, although, you know, people come to meditation practice at, at all sorts of stages of development, and that's, that's wonderful. Welcome, welcome where, <laughs> come as you are, sort of uh, idea is, is always supported. But it, it's not so focused on, um, you know, uh, repairing, uh, ruptured developmental processes, but more on um, helping to move into a new stage of development beyond the stable fixed sense of self where we're able to let go of that idea a little bit, um, maybe loosen our, loosen our tight grip on it, um, and sees that as even further, uh, further development, further fulfillment along a trajectory. Um, just as it said, when we've crossed the river, we no longer need the raft. Uh, the self is seen as perhaps a vehicle to get to the meditation or to get to the practice, uh, whatever that is, after which it, it becomes much less needed or slowly, gradually over time, less and less, uh, less and less needed. For most of us, this is not an either or or a complete situation, um, but little by little steps in that direction and that with each step, we are maybe experiencing less stress, less mental agitation, uh, and more peace and ease in our lives. So meditation practice is there to help us understand and support uh, this practice such that it proceeds along a healthy continuum of development. Um, now, since we know that psychedelics often occasion experiences of profound shifts in or even the complete loss of a sense of self, and that Western psychological models, most of them in general, don't cover the territory of this spectrum of development uh, or show us how to incorporate these kinds of experiences into our lives in meaningful ways. I would say integrate these experiences uh, through practices such as uh, embodiment practices, um, 
And, you know, the ones that come to my mind, there are many, but the ones that come to my mind are things like practices of generosity, um, practices of precepts, right? There are some standards for how to help work with those experiences in a real day-to-day life way. Um, Just examples, but those are a few of them. I know there are many. Um, It makes sense to turn to contemplative practices and to turn to this uh, psychological framework um, uh, and the psychologies from which they spring in order to better understand uh, and help our patients develop the ability to navigate this territory and navigate these experiences where they may uh, experience profound shift in their sense of self. Um, Help us figure out figure out with them what to do with that, right? Um, And the therapist's own model, the therapist's own contemplative practice can then become a model for assisting the patient in navigating similar experiences that psychedelics might occasion. So especially given that meditation practices are grounded in a theoretical framework that uh, defines them and um, sees them as part of a healthy development as opposed to conceptualizing them as another form of uh, pathology or simply something extraneous. So um, I hope I hope I've been clear. I'm going to take a couple of uh, questions. I do just want to I just do just want to say that you know by course of necessity I have I know that I've left a lot of things out. Um, but in this uh, in this particular talk I'm you know I'm, you may have questions about things that I are sort of beyond the scope here. Um, and let's see, uh, let's see what those are and where you've got to. And um, if the points that I have talked about here require further clarification, then we can certainly discuss and, and do that. How's that sound? I'm going to, uh, what, how are we doing on time? Oh, that's kind of perfect. I'm going to stop my share. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, no, I'm not. I forgot something. <laughs> Never mind. Um, that was the end, but I have one more slide that I want to share, which is this one. Um, this is my thank you slide, but it's also my contact information. I want to make sure that you all have it so you can find us. Uh, that's my email if you want to rate me. Um, and that's my website, which talks um, more about my work and about the uh, educational offerings. Um, we're not at the end yet, but I'll just go ahead right now and say special thanks to everybody at Menla, to Bet House, my team at Fluence, um, for your help and support of all of this, as well as my the research teams that I work with, NYU, PI, MAPS, um, and all of the various funders of all of those various projects, most of which I've listed here. Um, thank you to my contemplative practice communities. Um, as well as just say that, you know, I'm presenting my ideas here and they might be um, new or different. Uh, I really appreciate your coming out to, to listen and to engage in this discussion. Um, but my ideas are, are mine and only mine and only represent what I've said. So not any of the other people, not necessarily the other people's views. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to some Q&A. Um, I'm glad we covered that because I know some people, uh, some people might want to cut out a little bit early. Do, we, do you want to leave it like this or should I, do you want me to stop with a share? Uh, maybe leave it like that just for a minute so people can okay. get information. Yeah, yeah, I want people to make sure they get that. Yeah. And some time to type some questions as well. Great, great. All right. Um, so there is a question about accessing this kind of therapy or these kinds of resources, um, especially in the LA area, but is there a website to go to or a place to go to where you can find someone willing to do these kinds of therapies? So, yeah, so psychedelic assisted therapy with psilocybin and MDMA are, uh, only available in research settings right now, um, in the United States legally. Um, there are, uh, clinical trials going on in that area though. So I would suggest, um, I'm just going to tell you the, the easiest way <laughs> on my website, there is a, uh, a link for resources at the top and, um, there you'll see two links to explore for clinical trials. One is a website called clinicaltrials.gov. We've written some instructions for how to find psychedelic specific studies, Um, and then the other one is for the MAPS research. If you're interested in MDMA research, you can go there. 
uh, and sign up and they will do a pre-screen and um, if you're eligible for a local site they will connect you with that site. Um, one way that psychedelic assisted therapy um, might be accessible is by doing um, some work with ketamine. Um, so you can search for uh, ketamine, um, ketamine therapy providers um, who actually incorporate the principles of psychedelic assisted therapy into work with ketamine, uh, which is uh, available legally in medical uh, settings. Um, and there are some providers in there. I would suggest visiting the website CREA, uh, CREA. I believe it's CREA Conference or CREA.org, K-R-I-Y-A. If you just Google CREA, um, there's also a link on our website, but um, they have some great resources and as well as, um, as well as provider directories. Great, thank you, Linda. Sure. Uh, another one popped up. Uh, what is the recommended educational path? for someone who wants to become a practicing psychedelic psychotherapist. Do you recommend a PSYD or a PhD? Um, right now we don't know what the, um, you know, what regulations are going to require what kinds of education for what types of roles in, in this work. Um, so there's no way to give you a definitive answer. Like if you do this, you will qualify for that. It has just not been determined yet. Um, it depends on what you want to do. I think, you know, if your goal is to become a therapist and, um, you know, be the, be the main, uh, really have the bulk of your time spent with patients, um, I generally don't recommend a PhD because you're probably going to learn about a whole lot of things that are going to be um, extraneous to that. Uh, I suggest a program that's going to focus more on psychotherapy skills um, and definitely psychotherapy skills and uh, work experience with the population that you want to work with. Um, so for instance, if you're interested in providing MDMA-assisted treatment for PTSD, focus on finding a good program that's going to give you a background in uh, other forms of therapy for PTSD and getting experience working with that population. Um, and then, you know, do the extra education to add the MDMA piece. Thank you. Yeah. Hope that answered the question there. Um, let's pull up another one here. Uh, is there any outcome research that shows efficacy of this modality in trauma or in addiction? Um, so the status of research for post-traumatic stress disorder, there's a program of research called uh, MDMA-assisted treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that has that is in the middle of phase three right now. You can find published phase two results. They're very promising, but they're not big enough to big enough numbers to tell us um, you know enough data for uh, for statistical differences and approval. Um, and what was the second half of the question? I, I can, for yeah, It was, uh, <clears throat> is there any outcome research that shows efficacy of this modality in trauma or in addiction? Yeah, so again, um, I think the largest um, study of psilocybin assisted treatment for um, alcohol use disorder or would be the one for any, um, for any addiction in modern times. Um, and there's a phase two study that is just being closed up now. So there is a pilot study of that. You can take a look at that. Um, it was published, I think in 2015 um, by Michael Bogenschutz, um, but it's a, it's a small 10 person pilot study. Um, they're, the larger trials are, you know, they're underway. They're being, some of them are starting to be closed out now. Um, I expect we'll see more in the coming months. Um, a really great way to find out sort of the latest about this stuff. Uh, we do post a lot of video resources on our website under the media tab. But if you also take a look at some of the major conferences over the last year um, that have posted videos, they have conference talks in which people um, 
people discuss, you know, sort of the most up-to-date status of a lot of these projects. Um, and you'll be hearing about these projects in that format years before they're published. So um, I, I recommend conference talks a lot. They're free, they're online, they're all usually on YouTube. Um, and they can be a really fun resource. Plus you get to hear directly from the researcher telling the story about their research, um, which is sometimes more interesting than just reading the, reading the paper. Great, thank you. That's super exciting. That's a great resource. Mm -hmm. um, next one, got time for a few more questions. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on increasing for-profit companies that are in this kind of space? So there are a mix of companies that are in this space. Um, there are nonprofits, there are B Corps, there are for-profits, there are small ones, there are big ones. Um, there isn't necessarily, I, I don't think there's such a, um, you know, it just necessarily needs to be such a, a line between the two. I think there's actually a lot of overlap in terms of what they can do and what their business practices are. Um, keep in mind, lots of, um, lots of nonprofits have to make something off their product to make ends meet just because they're structured as a nonprofit. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they don't need to, you know, think about good business practices and sustainability. Um, there are a lot of, there seem to be a lot of new companies cropping up. Um, I think it's really interesting. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but, you know, I tend to look at like who's involved, what's their level of, um, you know, their level of uh, existing connection to the field and to the research um, and things that they've, uh, you know, sort of track record. What have they, what have they done? What have they achieved? Um, and I think there's some great uh, opportunity to create some sustainable businesses uh, that can do quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of good um, by being able to bring in a substantial amount of capital um, pretty quickly. Um, if you, you know, you look at the MAPS project, we're in the middle of phase three now. Um, uh, you know, the, the campaign to do that, do the research to get MDMA approved as a medicine started in 1986. So it's been slow. <laughs> um, it's been difficult. Of course, it was setting the precedent along the way. It was, it was a lot of firsts. Um, but part of that pace has also been, you know, dictated by the, um, the uh the the need to rely on donors for um for support so there's nothing wrong with that um but i think that now that um there are um investors willing to support some of these projects and companies that are wanting to engage in them um that you know it doesn't make sense to have every project take that long because we're doing it entirely on donations so I think we need a balance you know we need a balance we need a conversation and um you know certainly accountability and uh input from existing members of the field existing people that are established um uh, is is always a good uh sort of way to round things out okay great cool thank you um we have a few questions of kind of varying degrees about the um, states of consciousness, especially through meditation or through um, internal focus. So I'm trying to think of how to best ask the question. I guess, can you talk more about combining the use of the uh, psychedelic material with the meditation practice and how you can combine those to really help somebody go through different states of consciousness that transcend personal mm -hmm. ego and the self? Mm -hmm. Well, let me put it this way. It, if I'm seeing a patient in private practice who says, you know, they're thinking about going to have a psychedelic experience, um, one of the first things I'm gonna, I wanna ask them is, well, you know, have you tried any contemplative practices? Have you ever tried meditation or anything like that? Um, and that can kind of be seen as a, a little bit of a proxy, right? So if someone says, I can't sit still with myself for five minutes, um, I, you know, would say, okay, well, you know, psychedelics can be a pretty intense internal experience. And um, it sounds like it's hard for you to uh, go through 
you know, whatever it is that happens when, when that, you know, when that, when you get, you know, when you try to meditate. Um, so maybe that's something we want to investigate a little bit more. Um, simply because, you know, thinking of them as, as completely different, I think, um, you know, they, 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 it's it's nice to be able to for people to be able to go into those experiences knowing that they've got some um, some tools to work with potentially very bizarre overwhelming intense experiences right um, and those you know that that can be a good way of of um, just gauging somebody's skill set for that kind of uh, that kind of experience right right. And then the follow-up question there would be taking that and uh, applying it to the daily life outside of the therapeutic session. So how would you carry that forward into everyday practice or everyday thinking? Right. So this is an interesting place because a lot of, um, a lot of people, you know, will come out of a psychedelic experience feeling um, maybe a totally different relationship to themselves, maybe having really experienced um, you know, their values in a different way or feeling motivated to, uh, live, just live in a different way and live with, um, maybe more in a way that's more aligned with their values. Right. Um, one word for it is to live with more integrity, but that, that feels kind of judgmentally, but I don't mean it that way. I just mean like wholeness and alignment with one's values. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that our, you know, our psychological practices are particularly uh, great for that. Like we're, we're taught to symptom reduction, right? Um, but I do think that contemplative practices have a lot to offer in terms of teachings about like how to be in the world, uh, how to be in relation to others, what kinds of things you might want to try or notice um, that could help you to live a way that's, that's feeling more aligned. Um, so I think that's a place that, that we really can, um, that we really can turn to what kinds of states of mind do you want to develop? Um, yeah. And I, you know, I invite people to explore whatever practices are attractive to them and some will gravitate towards meditation. Others will not. That's fine. There's no, there's no prescription for it. Um, but I do think that there's, there's some value in, um, you know, looking at, what are the kinds of things that uh, are recommended uh, for, for ways of living in the world for someone who's trying to develop a meditation practice? Right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Very good answer. Um, we did have a more educational question. Um, mm -hmm. If you are already a licensed therapist, how can you set yourself up to be a psychedelic therapist um, besides doing your own work? Uh, what specific models can you suggest? Um, if you're already a licensed therapist, so again, the only ways um, that this is legally available right now are with, with MDMA and psilocybin are in the clinical trials. Um, and the only ways to get trained for clinical trials, most by and large, a few exceptions, but the only ways to get uh, training in the modality that's specific to the trials is to get trained for a specific research site. Um, so if you can affiliate with a research site that's putting together a study and wants to uh, bring you on as a therapist, <laughs> that's one way. Um, the therapy isn't really, the therapist training is um, by and large not really available to the public yet. Um, we do plan to offer some of it soon-ish, like within a year maybe, um, although it's not, it's not definite yet. There are some things that need to fall into place before that. Um, there's a place in California called the California Institute for Integral Studies. They have a certificate program uh, that does teach a lot of this, a lot of background and a lot of the beginnings of what one would need to uh, practice psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, but again, I just want to say there's no there's no established credential for this separate. Um, if there is going to be one, it hasn't been established yet. So uh, nobody can come out and tell you this is exactly what you need to do um, to be able to be practicing this three years from now. Just hasn't been, 
hasn't been determined yet. So I'm sorry, I wish I had more to tell you. <laughs> I wish I had better news, like sign up here. Uh, but it, it's, not, it's not the case. I mean, my, my company offers training in um, psychedelic integration for clinicians that is aligned with and consistent with pretty much the, the main leading models in research, especially the MAPS model. Um, and that's a great place to get started and a great place to be able to work with people who've had experiences in other settings. Um, so that's an option that's available now and that can be practiced now. But as far as the actual psychedelic assisted therapy, yeah, for this kind of work, it's not really, not really that available yet. But if you're here, you're already on the leading edge of the curve. So <laughs> you are, you are uh, by definition an early adopter because uh, many people are not even, really this is not on their radar yet. So take heart in that. Great, so everybody's in the right place. Yeah, you're all in the right place. <laughs> exactly um, where you are. <laughs> uh, so with just a few minutes left, uh, before everybody does leave, we'll get maybe to one more question, but I did want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, from Menla, from Elizabeth Nielsen, we are very grateful that you are here. You are the reason we are here. So thank you very much for being here tonight and participating and hopefully enjoying these teachings. I certainly know I did watching along with that. That was incredible information. And thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing. Thank again, you. The cutting edge of <laughs> where we are with these uh, teachings and knowledge. Yeah. Please do, please do join us. And we're going to have a retreat at Menla, hopefully in November. Um, and it will be for people who are interested in exploring the role of contemplative practice in psychedelic uh, and working with people who have used psychedelics for therapists. This archive video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Menla Tibet House US membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of membership, visit tibethouse.us.